Well, welcome everyone to Digital Hammurabi. Oops, oh, I, I hid Megan. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I am still getting used to stream. I was like, why are there only two people here? This is very, very strange. Um, so I, I'm Dr. Josh, uh, Digital Hammurabi. This is Megan, and with us today is a very, very special guest uh, that we're very excited uh, to have with us, and it is. Uh, Dr. Francesca Stavrakopoulou. Um, she is professor of Hebrew Bible and ancient religion in, um, in the theology and religion department at the University of Exeter in uh, the south of England. And Megan, isn't that, that's where your dad's from, right? It Down is. My dad lives in Bovey Tracy. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> just down the road. <laughs> Well, she is very well known, uh, not only for her work in Israelite religion, but um, also from, from the BBC series, uh, The Bible's Buried Secrets. And uh, so we're just, we're just tremendously excited to have you with us today. Um, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. No, honestly, I'm really chuffed um, to be doing this. So yay. And I love your title music, by the way. I've been meaning to tell you that for ages. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's cool. I just, I love it. <laughs> it was, um, it was, it's an original work by uh, Brock Benet, who is uh, a, a, a big fan of the shows, and he donated it to us for free. He played it on a, um, what is it, Megan? A, a his sitar. Yeah, his own sitar. Yeah. So, Fantastic. Uh, yeah, he came on and did it. He's a he's an Orthodox Jew, and uh, he came on live one time and played it live for the uh, for the opening. So it was really neat. It's really wow. Neat. Well, um, I, you know, we, we always like to let our guests kind of take a couple of minutes and give a bit of their background. Um, you can go as personal as you like, uh, you know, with how you got into the field, uh, maybe your educational background, just so that everybody kind of gets a feel for who you are and what you're all about. Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously I now specialize in Hebrew Bible and ancient religion, particularly uh, the material realities and social realities of Southern Levantine and other ancient Southwest Asian um, cultures, uh, made primarily of the Iron Age. Um, but I got into it because I did a theology degree at Oxford University. That was my undergraduate degree. So I, at school, so um, what guys, what you guys in the States call high school. So at secondary school, I did religious studies where we did stuff. Um, that was my first kind of exposure to the study of the Bible. Um, I didn't grow up in a religious family at all. I mean, I, I just, I've never been religious at all. Um, but I've always been really interested in ancient mythology. So particularly because of my Greek heritage, I've always been interested in the Greek myths. And so I was really into um, trying to work out why the hell everyone was treating Jesus so differently when clearly in Greek myth, it was perfectly normal for someone to have a deity as their father and a human as their mother. So I was just like, well, why, why is this Jesus dude kind of, why does he get all the attention still? Um, <laughs> and then when I was about 11, I discovered that Jesus was Jewish um, rather than Christian, because obviously that's, you know, quite a big discovery to make. Um, and so, yeah, I got really interested in it. So I ended up doing a theology degree as my first degree at Oxford University. Um, which was great. It was very kind of conventional. It was primarily um, based on Christianity and its kind of biblical antecedents and then wider Western Christianity, um, although I did as much Bible in that as I could. But that grounding in the Western intellectual religious tradition has been so important and valuable in my career since because you realise just how framed intellectual paradigms are by this very western christianized model of understanding the past um so you know when i was doing like medieval christian philosophy in my undergrad degree i didn't realize just quite how important that kind of stuff would become and thinking about the way in which you know the past was understood by some of the earliest sort of modern scientific um archaeologists and some of the modern biblical commentators and these people carry their baggage with them do you know what i mean they really carry mm. that intellectual cultural baggage so after my theology degree, I then did my, I stayed at Oxford and did my master's specialising in Hebrew Bible. And then I continued on at Oxford where I did my doctorate. Um, and that was working on King Manasseh and child sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible. So King Manasseh is like the biggest villain, the baddie of the Hebrew Bible. You know, there's nobody as bad as him. And child sacrifice is the worst practice, the worst religious thing that you could possibly do. 
and he's accused of, of performing child sacrifice. So I was really interested in that book and looking at the way in which the Hebrew Bible distorts what were the likely historical realities of the past. So we know that King Manasseh existed, for example. You know, we have Neo-Assyrian records that record his name, you know, alongside other vassals in the Southern Levant. But, um, you know, apart from that, all we know about this guy is what's written in the biblical texts and the biblical texts are biased. So I was looking at using history and archeology span um, to kind of draw a comparison between the biblical account of child sacrifice and King Manasseh and, uh, and you know, the kind of, to try to work out what the actual historical landscape was, then to compare that to the biblical portrayals, which are very varied, and then to argue why are these particular, why is this character and this practice, why is it so vilified? And then that got me into, um, you know, just more ancient Israelite religion. And uh, I ended up um, doing postdocs at Oxford and teaching there for a few years. And then I moved to Exeter um, University where I am now. And I've been here for too many years. Um, mm-hmm. I thought it would just be like one of those jobs, you know, when you get get your first kind of permanent job, and you think I'll be here for a few years, and I'll go. Now move on to something else. Yeah, exactly. But then it turned out my my colleagues in New Testament, massive shout out to David Horrell and Louise Lawrence. They are the most incredible people I've ever met, and it turned out to be such a brilliant environment for me. I'm the only Hebrew Bible person there, um, but it means that I can teach what I want. Um, I can say what I want, do what I want, basically. You know, I'm not as restricted as I might be in other universities. Um, so it's been great. And and so I've kind of progressed. And now I've got a chair in Hebrew Bible. And um, I can't quite believe that I'm this old. <laughs> <Now>. <laughs> Please don't say things like that. <laughs> no, we're, we're very close to the same age. So, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um. Man, that is uh, there. There is definitely something to say for uh, you know being in a place that you can kind of you can kind of branch out as you like and set things up in a way yeah. you're not you're not restricted. Um, a lot of responsibility, but you know a lot of that that kind of freedom is uh, it's a good feeling. So, well, I want to ask you and Megan. You know, I don't, I don't, I will have a tendency in this to monopolize this as the interviewer, and I, I don't want to do that. Megan has far more fascinating questions than I do. In general, um, I'll button if but, I need to. But I and I will say before before we get going, um, if anyone has questions, please put them in the side chat um, and tag me at Digital Hammurabi. I will save them to the end, and we will get through as many as we can. And we have had two super chats already, so thank you all very much. Uh, one from DTTV Science Answers for Forty Pounds, who says they love Bibles Buried Secrets. This guest is fantastic. I think that is an overwhelming agreement from everyone else. Um, and JB sends. Uh, two uh, dollars $2 and says hit that like button. So thank you very much, JB. Sorry, did you say 40 pounds? Four zero. Yes, I did. I think that might be the biggest super chat we've ever was, received. I think it is. At, wow, thank you uh, very, very much. I'm telling you, you're incredibly popular. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's going on. Um, but let's, you know, for for me, as I was telling you before we went live, you know, I grew up in a fundamentalist evangelical Christian um, household, and you know, so um, you know, I've, I've got my my English Bible here, um, and and if you flip to the Old Testament, you know, you don't have to worry about things like um, archaeology or you know, getting into historical sources at all. Um, you know, like you mentioned, the New Assyrians. Like, who who cares what they say? Because we we know what happened, right? And that's that's sort of the mentality, certainly the mentality that I had. In fact, um, a recent publication of a dissertation from Dallas Theological Seminary from a good friend of mine, uh, who comes from the same sort of background that I do, is writing about Daniel, Book of Daniel, and he said, well, you know, he's talking about one of the historical problems, and he says, well, Daniel is not just another person that we, you know, figure in. He is the standard yeah. by which we judge all other historical sources. Okay. So for for those of us that came from that kind of a background, um, and maybe that are listening in the audience, when you say um you know that the, the the Hebrew Bible has a bias, and maybe it's you know, maybe uh it's not presenting history uh, as it actually was, can you develop that just a little bit for us? Um yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Firstly, 
the Hebrew Bible, you know, we have this, Christianity has an awful lot to answer for um, in all sorts of ways. Um, but one of the things that early Christianity did was to, and I'm talking about Christianity in the first, you know, three, four centuries um, of its existence. One of the things that it really did was to cast um, the Jewish scriptures, because obviously Christianity was a Jewish movement. Um, and it was to cast the Jewish, the Hebrew scriptures as proof texts for the things that, that Christ followers were saying um, ab about this figure. And that historicized a lot of um, religious literature, Jewish literature that hadn't been historicized in quite the same way before. So almost kind of like, I'm not saying that it froze it, kind of, you know, froze it in plastic, you know, kind of like Han Solo uh, in Star Wars and gets put <laughs> in that whole thing. Um, but, but textual traditions within, as in much of the ancient world, but in Judaism up to the time of Christianity and into the early centuries of Christianity, it was, it was incredible. These texts were incredibly fluid. They were very unstable. You just look at something like the Dead Sea Scrolls as examples of how unstable traditions were, you know, huge differences um, in stories about characters like Enoch who, gets barely a mention in, in the Hebrew Bible. He pops up in, in Genesis. But then, you know, the literature that was being produced around uh, before the time of Jesus about Enoch was massive and vast. Things like, you know, even differences, you know, in um, the books of Samuels that we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that we know from the Greek versions, that we know from the Masoretic, the Hebrew versions are massively different. So we know that there was huge instability in these textual traditions. But what Christianity did um, very successfully was to cast a its messiah its hero as a historical figure somebody who was going to change history and not just kind of earthly worldly history but cosmic history um so things there was a very clear sense of the past and then the present and then this apocalyptic future because obviously all the all christians were waiting for jesus to come back and for the heavens to crash into the earthly realm obviously it didn't happen um but you know that was that was a major driving force for a lot of early Christian groups. But the other thing that they did was to kind of um, almost canonize, in some ways, uh, a lot of Jewish texts, and that's the sense in which Christianity in the Western world, in particular, um, has developed over two thousand years. So it gives us this sense that we look at these ancient texts that Christians call the Old Testament um, in Judaism. Obviously, it's Tanakh. Scholars try to be a little bit more. Um, use a less loaded term by referring to the Hebrew Bible rather than the Old Testament um, or Tanakh. But but what it did was that it kind of, we look at these texts now and we think that these texts were written to be a historical record of the past, but of course they weren't. Um, most of the texts that we have were written a long time after the events that they seek to describe, whether or not those events are real or not, like, you know, creation in six days or whatever, um, not real. Uh, things like the fall of Jerusalem, yeah, real, but even so, the biblical writers are, are telling it from a very, from their own biased perspective. And a lot of these texts were put together um, as they slowly began to become more authoritative in, and I'm talking about, you know, a few hundred years before Christ, um, as these religious texts came to be more authoritative, particularly Torah, so the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, um, they came to be understood as, um, a way of trying to tell a version of the past that accounted for the present and could therefore give some kind of instruction, religious instruction for the future. So the Hebrew Bible is inherently unreliable um, because it's not a primary source of evidence. You know, primary sources of evidence for the past are things like archaeology. And so what I try and do in my research and in my teaching is to emphasize that there's a difference between the biblical portrayal of the past and the likely historical reality of that past. And that likely historical reality, we can best piece it together. And obviously it's always gonna be fragmentary, but we can best piece it together by using things like archeology, span anthropology, other social and scientific methods, and kind of cultural comparisons with what we know of other, other Southern Levantine and ancient Southwest Asian cultures, including Mesopotamian cultures, including ancient Egyptian. Um, but that's how you build a more plausible portrait of a past society. And then you use the material remains that we have to make sense of what that means to ancient Israel and ancient Judah. And then obviously you then turn to the Hebrew Bible and say, OK, so how is this deviating? Why is it deviating? What can we tell from about the time that we th think these texts were being composed or redacted and compiled? You know, what can we tell 
about why certain biases might be inherent in this writing? That was a very long answer to your question. That was a beautiful <laughs> answer. No, and I thank you. And and to to kind of um, develop one little thing, have you develop it just a little bit? Um, right at the end, you you were talking about the archaeology and um, you know getting at uh, a, 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 as much as we can a complete picture, mm. or at least a more complete picture, and then taking that picture to the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. One of the things that one of the things that I'm sure you uh, deal with on on Twitter and and probably just in in everyday life is the, a movement in the opposite direction where you start with the biblical text, you start with the Hebrew Bible and you say, okay, now let me go either find archeological evidence that supports this picture. Um, or when you find something that, you know, stands against this picture, trying to reconcile it and to say, well, I know that this, this stance that I have, this understanding, this picture that I've, that the Hebrew Bible has presented, must be correct. So how do we get how do we get it so that you know Nebuchadnezzar can actually be um you how know his you know, style that biblical yeah. text with what we know of, of historical yeah. reality. Yeah we know Nabonidus is Belshazzar's father, but how do we get it so that Nebuchadnezzar is? Well you know now we go to linguistic arguments anyway. Um so you know can you just talk about that for a second and um, maybe a, a way to safeguard perhaps? Because I think a lot of people in our audience do this sort of thing at like an amateur level, which is that oh. we have some very intelligent people that watch oh. um, and they do this at an amateur level. How can they guard against doing this, um, you know, taking a, a, a conclusion and trying to then incorporate the archaeological evidence uh, or, you know, external evidence, primary sources, as opposed to building from the primary sources and then challenging um, yeah, you know, the picture presented. I mean, I think one of the most um, important things to do is to read widely in scholarship, if possible. Um, I always say to my students, don't read anything on the internet. And, and you know, if you're not sure about anything on the internet, just like send me the link because there's so much shit out there. You know, uh -huh. and because because you know, as we were talking just before we came on air, anything biblical is is um, it attracts. People are very invested in the Bible, um, and of course they are. Culturally, uh, it remains a huge icon, whether we believe in in its kind of religious and theological programs or not. We it's it remains a cultural icon, and there's a sense in which we have we kind of think that somehow it must be reliable. But you know, I would say the same thing. You know, imagine that this is um, you know you're trying to reconstruct the past using the Odyssey. Um, you know, would you really try to? Um, to 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 prove certain things are you know interpret certain archaeological sites or artifacts on the basis of the odyssey of, of course you wouldn't because you recognize that this isn't just straightforward the odyssey isn't about straightforward history writing i mean i'm i'm no expert on the odyssey but um there are some classicists and ancient historians who, who like to think that it reflects late bronze age um social practices and religious practices and maybe there are echoes of that in there but you know this, this, in terms of what we have in as literary evidence, we have to be really careful with what you know we call evidence. So the best thing to do is to read scholarship widely, but also um, I think to think about what assumptions are you bringing to a text. Mm -hmm. um, and I, none of us are without bias. I, I'm aware that I, um, of course, I have my own bias, and I, I realise that one of the things I've done through my research career, my my research, and my publications, is I'm trying to give a voice. I realise to those groups who appear to be vilified and marginalized in the bible's telling of the past so things like you know my lovely king manasseh um or you know oh you know child sacrifice wasn't that bad you know that kind of thing um, I mean, it was. but um but the way in which the hebrew bible writers um vilify and 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 deliberately caricature the indigenous inhabitants of the land you know, the canaanites as somehow sex crazed, um, unsophisticated, um, sort of superstitious, uh, yeah, um, pagan yeah. worshippers. You know, obviously that's just ridiculous. That's not the case at all. And actually, ancient Israelite religion was was Canaanite. You know, it was polytheistic. Mm. And I mean, the label Canaan is deeply problematic anyway, because you know, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. um, but ancient Israelite religion and Yahweh worship itself it emerged out of traditional northwest semitic religions that we find across southern and um, the southern levant you know so the things that we might call canaanite and so i think one of the things i've tried to do is to kind of give them a voice and say actually a this religion was really really deeply these 
it was deeply sophisticated. Um, mm. Polytheism, what I personally feel was a, a much better system than monotheism. Um, monotheism now doesn't really exist anyway. I mean, you know, look mm. at monotheisms today. They're not entirely convincing as monotheistic systems. So I think one of the things is uh, be aware of your bias um, and then try to check that bias against the ways in which you're kind of reading texts and artifacts. And the thing about artifacts as well, you know, archaeologically speaking, very little comes out of the ground with a label on it saying, you know, <laughs> made in Jerusalem right. in 732 BCE, you know. Um, so contextualization is important. I'm always very suspicious of scholars who they talk about ar archaeological findings and sites um and immediately say well this must be the site of biblical you know so and so um this particular biblical town or this must be you know an example of the sort of implement that we find described in you know jeremiah 22 or whatever and and yeah maybe but that shouldn't be the first port of call you need to look at the the cultural backstory of artifacts and sites like that you know see what what's the backstory that you know if you dig back further where where you know where do you get to who do you get to um so the Bible shouldn't be a primary resource in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you, as you say, it, it, it may be the case, but when you start with that, it's difficult for the brain to then look past often something that you know is, is your initial uh, point of comparison. So uh, obviously this must be, I'm writing a book now on the ritual use of uh, phonetically written texts. Uh, in Sumerian, and I have an idea of why they were used. The problem is that it's difficult now that I have this idea of what they're doing. Every you know supporting piece of evidence, I I pay really close attention to, and the ones that don't, it's harder for me to really focus in on those. And so it's it's difficult to do that. Um, and I think it's really important to you know to be yeah. able to. Um, and I think you have to listen as well when you when you do find things that that don't that kind of bump up against what you know you've been kind of working on this theory and you know the material evidence seems to be pointing in the direction and then you come up against something that does bump against that and you think it's important to listen to that and to think well how you know it's not necessarily a corrective but yeah. diversity in material and social um evidence is just as important as diversity that we have in literary and textual evidence and and i think it is important to hear it even if you're not think you know, I, I think about the Canaanites. We're having next Saturday, we're having Dr. Brendan Bentz on, who, you know, worked um, pretty extensively on the uh, on the Canaanites. And I, I'm really excited that he's a super nice guy. Um, but, you know, coming in and, and just trying to talk about um, things like we're going to talk about today with Israelite religion and, and talking about how is it that the Hebrew Bible, what is the Hebrew Bible doing and i feel like that's something that we say a lot about texts on this channel yeah. what is the text doing not you know, don't don't just come to it as a source of information you know to, to write down all right so this must be how it was it's look behind it and see the motive behind that text um so in in light of that so everybody tune in next saturday as well <laughs> uh for that but um you know in light of that what is the hebrew so if we're if we're looking at the Hebrew Bible as a as a tool, um, it, and not as our you know as our final authority, uh, we're using it as one tool in our toolkit. Um, what is it that we understand the Hebrew Bible to be doing when it talks about Israelite religion in the first millennium, um, and how does that differ from what was actually you know if if, if you know if we went back boots on the ground had a camcorder or something. You know, how does what the Hebrew Bible, um, the system that the Hebrew Bible puts forward, the Old Testament puts forward, how does that differ from what was actually going on? And, and why does the Hebrew Bible do that? Yeah. So the, the main nice, thing, easy question. I was gonna say, yeah, just like, <laughs> Go. <laughs> um, yeah. So right. like the main in obviously these texts are all, you know, the, the Hebrew Bible is an anthology, it's a compilation that's been put together much, much later, but even, so made up of different, what were originally different scrolls and stuff. Um, but even within those individual scrolls or books, like the Isaiah or you know, even, you know, the Torah or whatever, they were individual textual traditions, as well as different sorts of legends and stories and poems and all sorts of things. I mean, you just look at the book of Deuteronomy, you can see that you've got these poems stuck on the end and they do look you know they lots of bits of them do look very 
old. So it, you know, some of that might be the oldest material that we have, but they've clearly been appended to the end of Deuteronomy because they remained authoritative and important. Culturally, religiously, they remained important. It's like kind of having like an heirloom like passed down through the family that you don't want to get rid of, but you don't exactly want to use it every day. But, you know, but it has to, to go somewhere. Yeah. Um, so the texts were, were they're very composite. Um, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we were just talking about oh, no, Go ahead. You got it. Yeah, okay. what you're doing. So, so, so with the caveat, important caveat, the, the Hebrew Bible is a, a compilation and a very kind of um, varied compilation over several centuries and lots of different groups, scribal groups that, that have um, worked on these texts. With that proviso in mind, you can see that there has been a move and probably starting sometime around the 6th century to the 5th century BCE, when um, the agenda, religious agenda, was very much to present the religious past as having always been properly monotheistic. So in other words, Yahweh was always only the ever true God. So not that there weren't other gods. Biblical writers are very comfortable about, you know, acknowledging that there were other gods. But that you know Yahweh is the only God. Um, that monotheism is um, has very has, has a pedigree that goes right the way back to before creation, um, and that in the story of God's you know Yahweh's relationship with His people, the Israelites, um, who obviously start off as as Mesopotamians because of Abraham, and um, you know so there's this who comes out of Mesopotamia. So there's this sense that that Yahweh's relationship with him. With them has always been his he's insisted that i will be your deity i will you know um look after you i will grant me fertility and protection i will fight for you on the condition that you worship me and me alone and so the biblical story as we read um particularly through the torah and then the, the so-called historical books so the books of you know joshua judges samuel kings um that that once the people got into the land into the promised land they were their religion was corrupted by the indigenous Canaanite polytheism, um, and that this is the thing that caused all the problems. And so this is why Yahweh keeps kicking off and shouting at his people, and then eventually decides to punish them by bringing in first the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, um, and then you know later on, then obviously the Greeks. Um, yay, the Greeks! Uh, so yeah, <laughs> but there's a sense in which there, there's an ideology um, that's working throughout a, a very careful redactional layers, if you like, in certain biblical texts that's trying to insist that Yahweh worship is, should, you know, Yahweh is the only one true God, no other deities. Um, he's the creator God. He's the God responsible for animal and human and agricultural fertility. He's the God who's the, the warrior deity. Um, but the reality is, massively different you know archaeologically and even from some of those very ancient bits of poetry and other traditions um that we find in the hebrew bible the reality was different in that we know that ancient israelite religion was polytheistic was normatively traditionally polytheistic and that this sense of yahweh alone um wasn't widely shared um you know it didn't emerge until some scholars say 8th century bc I, I think that's pushing it i think that's being far too positive because they kind of phrase, you know, they link it around King Hezekiah, who supposedly mm -hmm. heard the Jerusalem Temple cult. Um, some sort of scholars say, no, no, it's seventh century. Um, you know, it's the time of King Josiah, who's mm -hmm. the great forming king. Yeah, again, ridiculous, I think, personally. Um, so it looks like the period when the Jerusalem Temple is first destroyed. You know, so why is you know, and when a temple was destroyed, it it was all about you know, you had worshippers had various different responses to this. You theologically, how do you deal with this? So quite normatively, and as we see in Sumerian texts and Assyrian texts, the, it would be simply, well, the deity has abandoned his or her mm -hmm. temple. They're pissed off, like, because you've done something wrong. They're pissed off, so they've abandoned the temple, and they're not going to help you. So if the, if the deity abandons the temple, the temple will fall. And so that's the most common theological response to the fall of the Jerusalem temple in about 587 BCE at the hands of the Babylonians. And so we find that a lot of the biblical, you know, the, the Hebrew scribes are saying it's Yahweh's abandoned Jerusalem because it's it's a punishment for our sins. Well, what were our sins? Oh, maybe it's because we worshipped all those other gods because we, you know, we weren't being committed enough to him. This is a deity who demands exclusive worship. And that's the kind of polemic that was very common anyway. You find that in, all over ancient Southwest Asia, that deities demand exclusivity. But there it was, it's, it, 
it didn't quite function in that way. You know, you can talk about um, it's not monotheism in, in the sense that all deities demanded certain exclusivity, but they they knew they were working. They knew like they existed, but you know, the deities knew they were working in a they were bound into a social network of gods, just as their humans were bound into their own social networks. So in a way, the biblical response to the destruction of the Jerusalem temple is, oh, shit, you know, you're always pissed off. We can't worship any other gods, so we should just worship him. But that was quite a, a traditional response anyway. But because the biblical texts are the work, not they're not representative of the religious land, the whole religious landscape. They're the work of urban scribal elites primarily coming out of places like Jerusalem. And then because they're elites, they're taken off to Babylon in exile. So they're, they're, they're not representative of what most people were doing and the way they were worshipping and all the different deities they were worshipping. Um, but the result is, is that we have this very biased, very slanted view that Yahweh was a God who always demanded exclusive worship and that this is the way that he ought to be worshipped. But the reality was massively different. The reality was polytheism, quite sensibly. Yeah. You know, I, I, I wrote my dissertation on actually those types of temple laments uh, in Sumerian, you know, so, you know, if, if, if any... They're, God, they're heartbreaking, you know, they're just yeah. like, oh. You know, and, and so if anything's going to be done, if a, a, a statue of a deity is going to be taken out on procession or if they're going to rebuild the wall, you know, a mud brick wall or something of the temple, the gala priest, you know, the one that's responsible to for appeasing the heart of the deity he 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 recites these laments, these emissal uh, Sumerian prayers, and they they what they do. And I know you know this, but I mean, like they describe just for the audience, they describe all the horrible things that will happen ostensibly if the deity gets pissed off and leaves and abandons yeah. them. And uh, it's just it's terrible the things that happen. Uh, so yeah, this idea of of uh, you know, looking back and going, well, he's gone, you know, and I, I think of Ezekiel, you know, that's the first you know, prophet that comes to mind when I think about that. Um, and, you know, him being picked up by the hair and taken back and he digs yeah. through the, the wall, you know, and he looks and he sees all the horrible things that are going on, the worship of Tammuz and the sun and whatever. Um, so in light of that, um, what, I, I asked a really broad question the last time. I don't want to do it again, um, but <laughs> I really want cool? you to just, <laughs> I, no, I just, I want you to have the freedom to, because like, this is your thing. Like I, so, so go wherever you want to go with it, but do, how, what was, what was religion like? I'm thinking um, the thing that always comes to mind uh, is that uh, Abbasidari, I think from Kintila Dajrud with, you know, the, the drawing there of uh, Yahweh and his Asherah. Um, so like what, what was religion like, uh, what, you know, I don't want to say like the average person, but I mean, you said that Yahweh wasn't always this, you know, yeah. God that demanded exclusivity. What was it like, um, sort of whatever you want to talk about with respect to that. Uh, Great. But given that, um, most of what we know comes from, um, biblical texts in that sense, you know, most of the detail of stuff that we have, some detail, coheres in the hebrew bible um asherah is the name of a goddess um but but it's vilified you know and but there's lots of references to a statue of asherah being in the jerusalem temple and we know externally you know from external evidence like the inscription from kuntla tajrud um which talks about yahweh and his asherah um we know that yahweh and asherah were paired together yahweh was the state deity um but state deity doesn't necessarily mean um uh doesn't necessarily mean kind of the official deity. It just simply means politically, you know, the, the patron deity of, of the King of Jerusalem, for example. Um, so Yahweh was the, the kind of the head deity and it looks like he had a, a partner deity, um, Asherah, which is completely normal because as I said, Israelite and Judahite religion um, was a subset of broader Northwest Semitic religions. And we know from Ugaritic texts, so mm -hmm. from the late Bronze Age, um, we know that, that Asherah um, was the wife of the head god there. Ugarit was a, a city-state um, with this incredibly brilliant, um, I mean, it was, it was a very wealthy, prosperous city um, for a long time. Um, but its its pantheon looks very similar to the sorts of flashes you get of pantheon in the Hebrew Bible. So rather, uh, Ugarit, Ael was the high god, and Asherah 
was his wife, um, or a theorist, as she's as she's called in in Ugarit. Um, but then you had like a second tier of deity. So these are the active gods. Ale and his wife were kind of semi-retired, you know, kind of like just letting the younger generation do their thing. So the younger generation were gods like Baal, um, a storm god and a warrior god, and Anat, his sister, who's amazing, like totally kick-ass. And we know that she was worshipped by um, Yahweh worshippers because uh, we've you know we found archaeologically sort of arrowheads with her name written on them in sort of israelite sites um she her name appears weirdly only a couple of times in the hebrew bible but a lot of the her kind of her signature moves if you like um kind of smashing skulls and trampling corpses and that kind of stuff a lot of her signature moves are, are applied to yahweh in the bible so it looks like he inherited those sorts of things you know from his older what's basically his older cultural cousin so Anna was a kick-ass deity as well. Um, you had other gods and goddesses, like, you know, you had Moat, who, the underworld deity, you know, or death, you know, is he is he a god or is he not? He kind of looks to be, you had Yam, who is the god of the sea. Um, you find these similar sorts of personalities um, in the Hebrew Bible. You, you find glimpses of what looks to be this inherited religious um, tradition that's been, a, that seems to have played a big part in the development of Yahweh worship but by the time we get to the Hebrew Bible Yahweh has kind of taken on a lot of the roles and functions and even the name of Ale um he's taken his wife Asherah it would seem um by the time we get to the Iron Age historically speaking so we we know that it was far more um pluralistic and polytheistic uh than than the Bible would have us believe so when the Bible's saying Oh, you know, you terrible Israelites, you keep setting up the high places, you know, the bar moats, the high places. Are, you know, this is references to other temples. And archaeologically, we know that there were lots of other temples all over the place, not just Jerusalem, not just Samaria. Um, so when we find bits of, of archaeology that, that attest to this much richer, um, much more textured uh, mythological and religious landscape, then, you know, we prioritise that and say, well, actually, that makes better sense of texts that we read in the Hebrew Bible. So for example, in the book of Jeremiah, there's this really weird couple of chapters in chapters seven and chapters 44, um, which in which Jeremiah, who's supposedly a sixth century prophet, so the Babylonians have invaded, the first sort of, um, of, of elites have been exiled, some have rushed off to Babylon, some have you know, gone off to Egypt. And, you know, Jeremiah is still like, you know, wandering around Jerusalem, shouting at people, um, like prophets tend to quite often to do. Um, and he's writing letters back and forth to people in Egypt, and he's saying to the Egyptians, you know, why are you worshiping the Queen of Heaven? And they and they're you know, they're from Jerusalem, they're elites in Jerusalem, and they say, We worship the Queen of Heaven, because when we were in Jerusalem and we worship the Queen of Heaven, we had everything, you know, we they 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 say we had food security, we had prosperity, we had no threat of the sword. And so this kind of goddess figure, you kind of get a glimpse of a tradition in which there was a very powerful goddess in Jerusalem who perhaps was Asherah. Um, most probably, if she's the queen of heaven, you kind of think she would be the partner to mm -hmm. the Yahweh, the king of heaven. Um, so you do get little glimpses, but they're like refractions, like distorted mm -hmm. reflections rather than direct kind of mirroring of the past. So you, you get that stuff. But things like that, like the goddess Asherah, I mean, she was incredibly important. And the very fact that we have not just this reference to Yahweh and Asherah from Kuntzlet Ajruz, but we have we have inscriptions that say the same thing from other sites, including tombs, um, high status tombs. You know, these were kind of wealthy political Jerusalem elites um, living in and around the capital city. And they had kind of landed estates with like you know, vineyards and olive groves and stuff. These were like wealthy people. And they're leaving, you know, they're, they're having inscriptions written in their tombs that are asking for Yahweh and Asherah to, to look, look after them in the afterlife. I mean, she was clearly an, a hugely important deity. Um, and yet, if you're just to rely on the Hebrew Bible, you'd think she was some awful foreign um, deity that, you know, some kind of awful uh, superstition. Um, but actually, she was, you know, really important. And her role was probably to act as um, the main mediator between worshippers and Yahweh himself. You know, her job was to kind of mediate between mythologically between gods in the polytheistic system, but also in terms of ritual to mediate between worshippers and, and Yahweh when they were trying to appeal to him. So mm -hmm. she was cool. I keep going off on tangents, but 
I, I think it's I'm, wonderful. <laughs> like <laughs> if, what my lectures are like. My students are like that. <laughs> what is she talking about? <laughs> well, well. Let, so let me ask yeah, you this: because the best lectures tend to take off slightly odd directions. <laughs> They're always the most interesting ones. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Well, so one of the other places that it'd be interesting to hear your perspective on, um, I think Richard Averbeck uh, read, read an article, remember how long ago he wrote it, uh, but uh, talking about glimpses of, you know, um, Ugaritic mythology and uh, these these types of chaos battle scenes, of course, that we see it, Ugarit, we see them, you know, in, in the Enuma Elish in, uh, you know, Mesopotamia. Um but you see some of these things in the Psalms, you know, sort of reflections of that, see it a little bit in Job. Um, but could you talk about that? And then maybe its appearance, maybe in a demythologized form. Um, and if you could say all that in a much more understandable way for everybody, that would be great in, in Genesis, uh, yeah. in Genesis one in particular. Yeah. Um, so the, what you're referring to is kind of, is broadly known as the kind of the chaos camp um, theories, this idea that, one of the, the common features in the mythological landscape across ancient Southwest Asia um, was this idea of a battle between a warrior deity or a group of warrior deities um, and some kind of monstrous sea deity. Uh, so obviously in the Numa Leash, it's Tiamat who weirdly, you know, who is obviously one of the oldest goddesses um, and kind of goes through this interesting shape-shifting throughout the Numa Leash um, you know, in which like one minute she's like this kind of scaly sea serpent, the next minute she's like this amniotic sack of kind of primeval fluid, and the next minute she's like this ferocious woman. I mean, that mythological text itself is hugely misogynistic in all sorts of ways, as we know. Um, but so, you know, we've got examples of it um, in the New Manish, but also obviously that's a later example in terms of Mesopotamian history. You know, we've got much earlier examples that like little hints in some of the very earliest um, Hittite mythology. Um, and obviously we find it at Ugarit in which um, the battle between the warrior deity and um, and the, the sea, the kind of chaotic um, forces of the sea, sometimes it's told in the battle between Baal and Yam, but we also have Anat, Yam's sister, you know, who says that she's the one that smokes the twisting serpent, you know, in the sea. She's the one that, that bound the many-headed encircler. So it's this seven-headed sea monster basically um and that in, in ugaritic mythology and that's exactly what we find in texts that we find in isaiah and in job and in the psalms um and people tend to think that you know well what's this myth doing it seems to be playing a part in a creation tradition um creation was never a one-off event in ancient mythology you know people think that like you create and then you've done it and it's fine but but ancient mythological ways of thinking was so different they, they weren't linear and they weren't even cyclical. They kind of like fold in and twist around on, on each other. And um, that's kind of the point of mythology. That's that's what kind of keeps the gods alive in a way. Um, so that you can have a god like Baal um, be killed by the god Moat, death, mm. and be buried in his tomb. And then, wow, three days later, he comes back to life and resurrects. We can talk about that another time, if you like. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, that's quite important in the grand scheme of world history. Um but yeah, so like in that Ugaritic myth in which um, you have this kind of fight with the sea monster, we, we find echoes of that same mythic trope in the Hebrew Bible. And we tend to think that this is, um, you know, this was probably an, another way of talking about creation. As I said, creation wasn't just a one-off event. Um, but we always think, oh, you know, creation in the Bible. Oh, right. Uh, Genesis, the world was created in six days and then, you know, bang. Or there's another story next door to Genesis, which is that God plants a garden and then makes the man and then pulls, you know, then makes several animals as a sexual partner for Adam before Adam's like, you seriously, dude, this is not doing it. <laughs> and, then he makes, and then he makes the woman. Um, but we only think that that's the, gen that's the kind of the ancient Israelite creation myth because it's at the beginning of Genesis and because that ended up in the beginning of our canonical Bibles. So it looks like these myths about God having a massive fight with a sea dragon um, that we see in Job and Psalms and Isaiah, that probably was the much more um, powerful creation myth um, associated with Yahweh, at least. And in some of those myths, 
it's a really physical, you know, it's a, there's a real sense of a physical fight in, in Psalm that talks about smashing, Yahweh smashing the heads, plural, the seven-headed creature, smashing the heads of the dragons. Um, and then by the time you get to the book of Job, Yahweh's like much more hands off. The writer of that particular poetic cycle in Job is really keen to, to try and distance Yahweh from the sense that he's got any kind of direct competitor you know in terms of sheer physical strength and so so in the poetic cycle in Job when he's talking about Yahweh's fight with the sea dragger who is called Leviathan um in that text another biblical text you know Yahweh's like yeah well you know can you trap it you know can you catch it on a hook so the way that Yahweh defeats the the dragon there is like he's just gone fishing whereas yeah. in Psalms he's like smashing his heads in he's having to physically fight so Job is like, oh, no, you know, Yahweh just threw a fishing net over him. He just like caught him on a hook. And then by the time you get to something like Genesis 1, which has been so stripped of its kind of mythological meat, you kind of just get this sense, um, oh, yeah, and Yahweh created the great sea dragons that are in the water. You know, that's in chapter 1. So he's like, they've become creatures. And then the rabbis themselves, they play on this idea, the early rabbis. So in Psalms, it talks about... Um, Yahweh created Leviathan to kind of to, to play in the sea and then early rabbis start to talk about the fact that you know what how did God spend his days and they divide up God's day into like different parts you know morning and then afternoon and, and what Yahweh likes to do in the evening is to spend time playing with his sea dragon it's his pet so there's this like incredible sense in which the idea of this this chaos monster was so it's so deeply rooted in the cultural and religious DNA of, of Yahweh worship that you can't just get rid of it. Even when monotheism supposedly mm -hmm. has come about, it, it doesn't just disappear. So it gets reshaped and, and kind of rehandled. So you start with this massive seven headed dragon he's having, and Yahweh's having to like punch it in the face. Yeah. Um, which is a great image. I can never get out of my head. Um, <laughs> and then obviously that seven-headed dragon reappears in the book of Revelation, you know, towards mm -hmm. the end, another big fight with dragons and stuff. But then you end up like with the rabbis saying that, you know, the Lord of the Leviathan was Yahweh's pet and um, that that he liked to play with. And then they start talking about the fact that, um, you know, that he captured Leviathan and he kind of kept it in a watery store cupboard. And that at the end of days, he's going to kind of open up the watery store cupboard, bring out Leviathan, kill it, and serve it up as this kind of apocalyptic feast mm. for worshippers at the end. So they, this sea dragon, you know, you kind of think, what dragons in the Bible? But like, the, it's one of the most important kind of parts of Yahweh's story, if you like, mm. um, for, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So that's it's really of how like, you know, Canaanite mythology ends up in the Bible. It's really interesting that kind of development, you know, you see it also in, um, you know, Mesopotamian mythology. So, you know, you know um, Ninorta earlier on in the uh, second millennium, you know, he he fights against the Anzu bird who has the tablet of destinies and he, he, he loses and then he's got to get advice and then he goes back yeah. again and he's able to trick the person that has the, you know, the, the Anzu bird who has the tablet of destinies to win. But it's not like by sheer might that he wins. It's by, yeah. you know, cunning. By the time you get to the Enuma Elish, you know, Marduk, Marduk as, 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 some wind at it and, yeah, as you know. he's approaching, I mean, well, even before, like as he's approaching um, Kingu, who's holding the Tablet of Destinies, he's just defeated by his approach. Perfect. You know, so that this idea of 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 development of might and of power borrowing yeah. from this tradition, I, you know, it's, it's fascinating to see. And what's interesting about it, too, is that you see it exactly the same kind of development um, in biblical and Mesopotamian theology is that. If you look at something like in the Umer Leash, the way that Marduk defeats Tiamat, I mean, obviously there's a lot of physical grappling, you know, um, and he's like got all, he's got deluge and he's, you know, firing arrows and stuff. But it's also with words, you know, she, it's, it's, it's Marduk's speech that ultimately in defeats Tiamat, just as in the same way that, you know, Yahweh is so powerful that all he has to do in Genesis is to speak creation mm -hmm. being, you know, and it's that sense in which somehow, words become you know and because partly because they're magic but also because these are scribes that are producing this stuff it's in their interest to big up the written word and yeah. so there's this sense in which somehow the more um the more emphasis you have on a kind of a written and a kind of an uttered um religion or ritual or magical spell or whatever it yeah. is then the more hands-off the deities themselves become they become less willing in mythology in kind of mythology to kind of get their hands dirty yeah and in fact, and, um, 
just as a little plug, this is I've written about this quite a lot in a book that's coming out. My first book for non-academic um, audiences for some non-specialists is coming out next year. And it's an anatomy of God in which I kind of talk about um, how Yahweh changes from this bodied deity into the kind of the weird idea of God that we have today. But I deal with some of that, the, the way in which there's a deliberate kind of um, reduction of this very um, material bodied deity um, mm. and that you can see some similar tendencies in other ancient Southwest um, Asian religions as well. So, mm. but yeah, that's just a little plug. Yeah, please, um, you know, if you have a link to like a pre-order place or something, send it to us. We'll put it in the video description. Oh, yeah, no I'll, no, I'll come on the show and talk about it when it's out next year. Oh, It'll awesome. Be well, yeah, so. I'll, I did I'll actually say to Josh, you realize we have to invite her back on to talk about the new book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about 20 minutes before we send you the link <laughs> oh I, that would be a phenomenal um i don't know if it, we have 200 people watching which is wow. you know uh, quite quite a bit people watching um so because I, of that i'm gonna break in and say we've had nearly 40 questions so yeah that's what i was gonna maybe, say we've oh, okay, gone about awesome. 50 minutes so maybe we, we turn it over to uh to the audience if that's okay with you yeah yeah of course perfect Wonderful. Uh, yeah, so we have currently 204 people watching, and given our live streams normally top out at around 50 or 60, this is pretty good going. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. <laughs> and the live chat has been fantastic. Everyone has been very civil and respectful, which I always appreciate. And we will be starting with some super chat questions that we have. Uh, so first of all, Skeptics Propaganda for $9.99, thank you, says, do you think that the king of Salem, Melchizedek, in Genesis was originally a priest of Ale, the Canaanite god, and was then conflated with Yahweh in the Hebrew Bible? Um. Mm possibly uh, there's traditions i mean what's what's being referred to as stuff that we find in genesis and in the psalms um so an older view particularly one that was kind of supported by that older generation of u.s scholars like frank moore cross um uh was that melchizedek um that tradition in the hebrew bible seems to reflect the idea of a high priest of jerusalem and that jerusalem was originally a, a, a city devoted to ale it's possible, but we just don't know enough. Um, we don't. We don't. We don't even know enough about the way in which Yahweh and El relate. So some scholars think that the name Yahweh itself came out of an epithet of El. Um, you know, El who brings into being or some such. Um, obviously, El was seems to have been the original god of Israel. If we look at the theophoric element in the name mm -hmm. Israel, if we look at some. Um, names of some ancient sanctuaries that are given in the, in the Bible where it talks about Ael, the God of Israel. Um, you know, an altar is built to Ael, the God of Israel. It's kind of straightforward. Um, but but even, you know, we've got some traditions like in Deuteronomy 32 that seem to imply that Yahweh was originally one of the sons of Ael. Um, so could he have been kind of written into that mythology that way? We don't know. As of Melchizedek, it looks like a very ancient tradition, but it's been so there's so little of it in the Hebrew Bible and even what is there looks to be quite overworked anyway um, in terms of what it's trying to say about Salem. I mean, if you think about Jerusalem, the name itself suggests that it was originally um, a city devoted to a deity, um, one of the, you know, to a, one of the twin deities, dawn and dusk. Mm. Um, so we can't, we can't really know, but in Ugaritic tradition, those deities might have been daughters of Baal or Ael. I mean, we we just don't know. So I think it's a really great question, but I just don't, we just don't Not know. Not really possible to be definitive. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, Swat, I think anyway, for five pounds, do you have anything to say about the shift from polytheism to monotheism via monolatry? Monolat I don't know what that word is. Yeah. But perhaps as ev evidenced in the Old Testament text. Mm, yeah, that's one theory that people quite like. So the idea of, of a monolatrous theological system is that there's an acknowledgement that there are other gods, but you only worship one. Um, and it may be, scholars, more sort of old fashioned um, Hebrew Bible scholars like to think that that's the way things probably went. Um, so you went from a kind of, a polytheism in which you had most of the deities were kind of stripped of their agency and power anyway 
So they became, you know, merely one among a number of the sons of God um, or the sons of Ale. So that kind of, they, this has become the, the counsellors, if you like, of, mm -hmm. um, of Yahweh. Um, and that gradually as you, Yahweh gets more and more important, so they fall away. I, I find the term monol actually difficult, the idea of it difficult, because any priest or any prophet, for example, would in a cultic role in their ritual life be monolatrous they would be offering uh, and we see this in mesopotamia as well so mm -hmm. you can have certain prophets or um priestesses devoted you know they are the the main cult so a specific player. individual but they, deity yeah that, but that's just in the cult in that particular mm -hmm. ceremony that particular religion a ritual doesn't mean to say that they don't worship any of the other gods of course they do um, so I think monolatry is quite a difficult category. So I do think that what we have instead is rather than a shift of from polytheism to monotheism, what we see is more a prioritization of Yahweh within a polytheistic context originally, by which he becomes, he gradually takes on more and more of the roles of the other deities, including roles of like Asherah, um, you know, because Yahweh becomes this kind of divine midwife in lots of Hebrew Bible texts. And that's the kind of role that Asherah um, and her, other goddesses um, associated with her would have would have performed. So it's more a prioritization. But then we don't know because that's going on the way in which you know what we can glean by reading critically the Hebrew Bible text. I mean, in historical reality, we know that goddesses and various other deities continue to be worshipped for loads longer um, than we think. I mean, to what extent can we even talk about monotheism in ancient Judaism and? earliest Christianity. I, I think it's a completely inappropriate term to use. And arguably, it's still an inappropriate term to use today of um, Christianity and some forms of Judaism. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, Hi Clef uh, sent us $5, thank you very much, and said, I just wanted to say, it's been a pleasure watching you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with dogmatists and crackpots on the BBC's Big Questions. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> it sounds like it must be a very enjoyable watch, but possibly a little stressful to film. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sentinel Apologetics for five dollars says, in regards to Asherah, the problem is the final letter hey would need to be read as a masculine suffix rather than a feminine ending. Yeah, there are lots of arguments about this. So um, some scholars, so basically in some of the Hebrew inscriptions um, that we have, talk about Yahweh and his Asherah. Some people think, um, is this a possessive pronoun on the end? That means his Asherah, does that suggest that it's not an actual deity, but an object of some kind? Mm -hmm. um, other scholars um, have argued that you can't read, then that's a biblical Hebrew kind of construct rather than a paleographic Hebrew construct. So to what extent can we assume that paleographic Hebrew worked in the same way? Mm -hmm. um, and so we also need to take into account the idea of different dialects almost in terms of pronunciation. And there's so little that we don't really know. Um, so yeah, I got the, the debate about what do the what does what does the term Asherah um, or Asherata in these inscriptions means? Um, the debate about it has gone on and on and on, but most scholars come down on the side of saying this is a proper name of a deity mm. um, and kind of attempt to sort of try and diminish it by saying, and even if it does refer to a cult object, the fact is, is that deities were identified with their cult objects. Um, mm -hmm. The Ark of the Covenant, for example, in the Hebrew Bible, um, that's addressed as Yahweh quite often because um, it functioned as his footstool. And just as we know, the items of furniture in Mesopotamian religions could be identified with their deities. So mm -hmm. in some ways, it's it's not really an argument. Lovely, thank you. Um, RAF4 says tangents are not only appreciated but encouraged. Um, and that came with $5, so thank you very much. I enjoy a good tangent. Uh, I think it's we all do. Well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, Thomas Payne sends $5 um, and says the role, I, I think I may need to rephrase this. Um, can you speak on the role of Inanna or Sophia in the ancient world? Was rising, were rising and dying gods older than the New Testament? That, that, yeah, there's two kind of different questions there. Um, we see, I mean, Sophia is, is wisdom, um, and that's the term that's often used for a character known as Hochma in Hebrew traditions, who seems to be personified as a, a, a female deity. Um, I think those characters are probably drawn on 
on real deities that were worshipped, um, real as in religiously real, not real mm. as in they existed. Um, and uh, what was the other bit? Oh, about dying and rising gods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some debate about the land, even you referring to dying and rising gods, that's quite a problematic um, yep. label to use now. Um, so deities like Tammuz and Baal, um, uh, you know, do, do, do they die and rise in quite that way? But in terms of um, the notion that a deity can die and then quite, you know, come back up from the underworld realm and up into the heavenly realm again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like well old, much, much predates the Hebrew Bible um, by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So, yeah, there's nothing original, to be honest. <laughs> uh, nothing new under the sun, as it says in Kohelet. And yeah. um, in terms of religion, there really is very little that's new. Thank you. Um, Scott Duke sent uh, $9.99 and said this is one of the best channels on the internet, which I personally appreciate very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Sentinel Apologetics again with $5. I've been leading a study group on Revelation with a focus on Ivory Tower scholarship, and I've shown the Leviathan barbecue at the marriage supper. Not so much a question as a statement. Thank you very much, Sentinel Apologetics. Uh, Thomas Payne sends $5 and says, Dr. Fran is greater than both Lara Croft and Indiana Jones, uh, which I definitely agree with uh, <laughs> for many, many reasons. Um, not least of which she doesn't lose things. <laughs> Um, and Harley Wikes sends five pounds and asks, did the Old Testament authors want the Genesis creation stories to be read literally? What about the centuries old ages of the Genesis characters? Mm. Um, the idea that, you know, were these texts, particularly in Genesis, written to be read literally um, kind of links to the other idea we we're discussing earlier about, you know, what is the purpose of these texts? And the biblical writers weren't intending them something like genesis you know the idea of the world being made in seven days or the the great ages of the ancestors um they weren't intended to be read literally in the way that modern people might understand literal reading today um that's just not how the ancient mythological religious mind worked in that sense the huge ages of um of the ancestors i mean again we see this in other mesopotamian literature partly it reflects their they're almost they're, they're living in a in that kind of that dusky bit between mythological reality and human reality so it shows that there's something not quite mortal about them that these were extraordinary characters they were more they were closer to the divine than they were to the mortal um so that partly uh, accounts um for their long ages but also in in the hebrew bible specifically these long ages are also seen as like a blessing from from God and the longer you live, um, the, the greater your lifespan, the then more the blessed you are. better you are, exactly. So in that sense, no one would have understood them to be actual, I don't think they would have thought Melchizedek was literally, um, you know, uh, mm. old or whatever. But, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to say, but yeah, they weren't read literally in the way that we might assume literal time spans today. I mean, I feel like it, it, just to a degree, um, it's imposing a very modern framework mindset on this that we think this way. And so, yeah. you know, I, I think it's not I think we need to allow for a different you know, way of thinking about texts yeah. in general. Yeah, I, that, and completely. And that's one of those things that I carry into my research. You know, you think about what are your assumptions? Is your assumption mm -hmm. to be aware that I'm a I'm a modern Westerner? Um, plus I'm European, plus I'm British, plus I'm a woman. And all of these things play into, you know, plus I'm not from a posh kind of background, like a lot of academics in my field, mm -hmm. plus I'm an atheist. Um, and all of that I know is that my baggage that I carry into, that that shapes the way that I view texts. And, but just very fact of being from a different time and a place than the biblical writers means that I need You're to be- viewing it differently anyway, yeah. But yeah, the, the time was seen as very differently than we see it today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, David Connor sent $10. Thank you very much. And says, is there a specific date I can put into my calendar for the release of your much anticipated book? <laughs> and will there be an awesome documentary to accompany it? Um, well, thanks to coronavirus, uh, <laughs> the specific date is quite difficult to pin down at the moment, mm -hmm. given the public. Um, so it was scheduled for March next year, but it's looking like that might have to be pushed back to September, just because mm. of 
mm-hmm. public schedules and, and that kind of stuff. Um, as for documentaries, I don't know. I've had some offers, uh, but, um, you know, these things are always very difficult to... It, there's a very big gap between talking about a documentary and actually seeing it on telly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will be doing, hopefully, you know, in a, if we're allowed to kind of travel again, um, I will be coming over to the States to do um, book tours and I'll be doing book tours in the UK and in Europe as well. So um, that's the plan, whether or not that that will actually happen in the COVID-19 world, yeah. I don't know. You know, but maybe watched, if you are, if you are, yeah, if you, if you are over here, maybe we can convince you to come into our amazing studio and do an interview, <laughs> you know, live. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. I don't think I don't think our studio is big enough. <laughs> Come on, we'll make it happen. I'll yeah. buy a new studio. So. <laughs> I would though. I just want you to know that. <laughs> oh, beautiful. We could like, uh, green screen and act stuff out. Cool. We could we could do that. It would be hilarious. Um, <laughs> there'd be dogs and children running all over the place. <laughs> Um, Julian Bruckner sends $5. Thank you very much. And says, speaking of underworld, what was the Canaanites slash Israelite view of death, moat, et cetera? And did they have an afterlife? Yeah. And, and it was very similar to Hebrew Bible, um, view. So death was not the end. Um, the underworld was not a bad place. Uh, everybody went into the underworld. Um, well, everyone went into the, to the ground when they died and it was up to, your living descendants to can maintain your existence. So the idea was that death didn't break the social relationships between the living and the dead. Um, it just changed the nature of that relationship. And in terms of an afterlife, you only exist for as long as you're remembered. So things like invoking the name of your dead parent or dead cousin or dead great, great, great grandparents was incredibly important. But also important was maintaining the material integrity of your bones and your tomb. Um, which is why, um, you know, even today in our own cultures, you know, we find it very difficult when graves are desecrated or, you know, or if people go missing and we, we never find their bodies, you know, the material reality um, of death was incredibly important to maintaining some kind of post-mortem existence. Um, and so, yeah, the underworld was a good place. Um, everybody went there. You could have a good time in the underworld or a bad time, depending on how good you're living relatives were at kind of like looking after you um mm-hmm. people start going to heaven um until a bit later on lovely thank you um angela natal says are there any new discoveries about asherah and her cult in pre-exilic israel and what do we know about it for sure mm. um well we can't know anything for sure um we just have to work in terms of probably one of the joys of history <laughs> yeah i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to step away for 20 seconds because i hear oliver up Walking around upstairs. I'll be back. And yeah, we know we're, we're probably, you know, most of us are, are pretty, you know, we could say with some probability that Ashra was this incredible um prison. <laughs> oh, hang on. She was a key part of ancient Israelite religion. In terms of new discoveries, um, there haven't been any new inscriptions recently, but then there are very few inscriptions. I mean, surprisingly few inscriptions. Mm-hmm from pre-exilic Israel and Judah, um, which I think speaks to the social and economic and political context of ancient Israel and Judah. They're not quite, they're not quite writing in the same way. They would tend to be writing on scrolls perhaps rather than um, Mm -hmm. inscriptions. But even so, it's surprising the lack of inscriptions that we have, given that it's such an over-excavated part of the world today. but yeah, nothing new in terms of inscriptions, but there are always things, um, things that bits of um, fa- fragments of figurines that, that scholars used to dismiss as being Canaanites um, are very quickly being re- identified as mm-hmm. uh, actually clearly sort of Israelite or mm-hmm. uh, you know, of, of that kind of culture. And so they may well, some that have been misidentified as kind of Canaanite goddesses may well be Israelite goddesses. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Carlos Rodriguez says, does the Hebrew Bible contain evidence that early worshippers of Yahweh not only practiced child sacrifice, but were explicitly commanded to do so by Yahweh as a punishment? Um, yeah, that is. I mean, the Hebrew Bible is very explicit about God commanding people to um, sacrifice their children. Um, uh, obviously, there's a story in Genesis, but some of the material in Exodus says uh, has Yahweh saying you know you shall 
offer up the first one, not just of your of your lambs, um, of your sheep and um, your oxen, but also your children. But they there's written into it a kind of redemption clause. You know, you can don't have to actually sacrifice the baby. What you can do is circumcise your son on the eighth day of life rather than sacrifice it, or you can pay money to the local sanctuary. Um, but then there are other texts like in Ezekiel um, chapter 20, which very clearly says, you know, Yahweh, you gave them instruction that was not good. You commanded them to offer up their children. So there was clearly a lot of debate going on um, among biblical scholars about, you know, was this commanded by Yahweh or not? Clearly, some people thought it was. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Sentinel Apologetics again sends us $2. Thank you very much. Uh, are Psalm 82 and Deuteronomy 32 8 related? Oh, good question. Um, mythologically, possibly, um, in the sense that they both, in, they're both ancient poems that have been very reworked problematically um, for us, but they seem to exhibit a similar kind of um, image of a polytheistic divine council. Um, one seems to have, you know, it's unsure, you know, is it Ale in Psalm 82, who is the head of the divine council, or is it Yahweh? In Psalm in Deuteronomy 32, it's clearly Ale is the top dog, or El Elyon. Um, but whether they're in, sort of intertextually related, are they literary relations in that we can't really know? It's, it's possible. Um, the fact is, is that these were both clearly very important, um, again, is examples of really important literary traditions that despite the way that they jut up against the kind of the monotheistic ideology of biblical redactors and compilers. The fact is they're still in the collection, so it's deemed to be important enough, you know, to, to keep and rework. So there's probably a relationship between them. They mm. probably, you know, if I was really pushed, I'd say they probably do speak to some kind of ritual, um, mythological context associated with the cult of the human king. Um, probably in Jerusalem but that that's me just sort of saying if I was really pushed if I had to imagine a way you had to yeah yeah thank you uh Koto Marx says regarding name changes was it possible that names like Jeroboam and Rehabam had the Baal identity in them originally yeah and I mean we see it you know with some names that have been given a Bochette um a distortion in the Masoretic text so which means shame um but were originally probably Baal like um Ishbal is you know Ishbosheth so Saul's son probably called Ishbal first before he became Ishbosheth. Um, so yeah, the ancient scribes love dicking about with their text. <laughs> <laughs> and they do it for all sorts of reasons. Um, but yeah, I think there's been a lot of deliberate um, a, a, a bastardizing of mm -hmm. other, um, other deities' names in Hebrew Bible texts. Thank you. Um, Paddy McDougall asks, did the 10 tribes of Israel get disseminated into Assyria? See, I'm one of those people um, that says, can we really talk about tribes historically? Can we really talk about <laughs> Is that a really in like the 8th century BC? Yeah, we know that some of these territories, according to the Bible, are named, you know, after these tribal names. We have. But can we really talk? I, I don't think we can really talk about it. I do think that... Um, the idea that the whole of, um, you know, the Hebrew Bible would have it, that when uh, the Neo-Assyrians, um, you know, defeated Samaria in about 721, that um, that they kind of like <laughs> exported the entire <laughs> population off and no one's gone again. Obviously, everyone's that. gone. Yeah, <laughs> everyone is empty, empty. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously they, they stayed. Um, I'm very interested as a little sideline, not that I've, I've written much about it at all, but in, look at modern Samaritan claims and they claim to be the direct descendants of the Israelite people who were um, who were defeated by, by the Assyrians in the eighth century. Um, and they're still there. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, some of them, some of those groups of people, yeah, they were, I mean, politically and geographically, they territorially, they were assimilated into Assyria because Assyria's, that was what Assyria was it doing. It was an empire, it was what it was, yeah. It was what it was, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think they were, I mean, if you look at what we know, I mean, there was a temple to Yahweh on Mount Gerizim in the 4th century BCE that was probably on the site of much older temples anyway to Yahweh. So if you read the Hebrew Bible, you never get a sense that there was another temple there to Yahweh. I mean, mm -hmm. 
but archaeologically we've got lots of proof that it was there and we've got inscriptions to Yahweh um dedications and prayers written by Yahweh worshippers good Yahweh worshippers talking about the sacrifice they've made to Yahweh so mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they didn't disappear into Assyria. Most people stayed exactly where they were, just as they did in, in and around Jerusalem. You know, it was only the elites that were taken off to exile in the 6th century. Most mm -hmm. normal Judahites, normal Yahweh, they carried on just doing their thing. But they've been misrepresented and marginalised by the big writers who were the, the descendants, if you like, of the those. elites who were taken and, away. Yeah. And therefore the most important people, of course. Um, we fair. probably... We probably we have, have time for maybe one more question. We have three more super chats. Oh, good grief. Okay. Well, <laughs> maybe we can do those and then. And then I think we I might have to cut everyone off. I'm yeah. sorry, guys. Um, ben Lamaru sends $5 and says, are Elyon and Yahweh meant to be two separate beings in Deuteronomy 32? I've heard others argue that they're meant to be one with Elyon keeping Judah as his own. Yeah. So this is the little poem in Deuteronomy I was talking about where it looks to be that Yahweh is a, a, a divine son of Elion, um, so who is Ael. Mm -hmm. um, and we've basically got differences between the Masoretic version of so the Hebrew version of this poem and then what we find in the Greek translation. Um, so if you look in the e most English translations today in like a bog standard Bible, you, you, you read it and the word own has been inserted into English translations so that it says, when Elion divided the nations according to the number of the gods, um, Israel was his, you know, was his own portion, Jacob his allotted share. Mm. So it makes it sound like Elion is Yahweh, the God who's who has Jacob as or Israel as people. Um, but actually the ancient um versions of this don't have this kind of are much more clear. It's that Elion is the one that divides up and Jacob is a portion. Elion apportions um Jacob to Yahweh, basically. Mm. So um yeah, they're two in the in the oldest tradition, textual traditions um, of that poem. Elion and Yahweh are two separate deities, and Yahweh is subordinate to Elion. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Oliver Wilson sends nine dollars and ninety nine cents. Thank you very much, and he says thank you for hosting Doctor Francesca Knowledge Overload. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> uh, for, uh, Vibrantly Brantley sends two dollars and says Vibrantly Brantley for two dollars asks because that is how Brant's sense of humor works. So thank you, Brant, for that very confusing question. Um, uh, we've got five minutes. Can we do one more question? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, Chad it's, I'm, Warner. I'm sorry, that wasn't a question for me, was it? It's going to mute again. Yeah, that's not for me. <laughs> Chad Horner says, it seems like there's a lot of xenophobia and racism in the Bible, especially towards the Egyptians and Hebrews. I wonder if you could please comment, on, oh, between the Egyptians and Hebrews, I wonder if you could please comment on this. Many thanks. Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, the notion of race as a category is a modern construct. Um, uh, there is a sense in which, and even talking about ethnicities in ancient world, um, is very difficult. But there is a sense of there are lots of different othering strategies and othering in the Hebrew Bible tends not to um, happen, uh, tends not to be indexed in terms of things like skin tone or sexuality even, um, or sometimes language, sometimes the way you speak, you know, you've got a funny accent, you know, we all hear that. Um, but it tends to be done in terms of power relationships. And Egypt was always um, a place of extreme power, even though... When we look at it on the world stage, it, you know, it had hugely declined its empire by the time you've got the biblical writers who are talking about, you know, ancient Israel. But even so, culturally, it was still massively influential. Um, and so Egypt in the Hebrew Bible stories is often presented as a place of um, where you go either to escape famine or you go um, when, when your own homeland is inhospitable. And so it's seen as a place of, of huge anxiety. So there is quite, I mean, it's not just the Egyptians. I mean, Foreigners, you know, tend to be like the Babylonians um, are kind of caricatured. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much racism as an othering of people who are in a position of power over you, generally. That's Fantastic. great. No, that was wonderful. Thank you. And everyone, I'm very sorry. Um, we had just so many questions. I think yeah. if we went through them all, we would be here for another hour and a half. Um, so I'm sorry. Uh, thank you all for your interest. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, this this has been great. Us. Yeah, um, and I, I, yeah, I'd love to I'd love to have you back. Obviously, um, 
do you want to take a second and just kind of tell people where they can find you and, um, you know, anything yeah. else that you um, kind of want them to look at? Well, no, I'm, I'm just, I just, this has been nice because I've been locked down for so long. It's just really nice to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see you tomorrow then. This will be great. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I look out for the book next year. Um, it's called God and Anatomy, and uh, it's even got pictures. Um, and it's very graphic, and uh, I've loved writing it, but it's been the hardest thing I think I've ever written far harder than writing scholarship because I'm mm. you know, you don't have to explain stuff in some ways to um, to a scholarly audience, but this this has been a challenge. But I've loved writing it. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, what am I at Prof Francesca? The Twitter link is in the description of the video. If anyone wants to just click on it, it's right yeah. there. And there's all sorts of my stuff out there on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. But thank you very much for all the questions. They were great questions. Really cool. Yeah. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this probably more than anyone should enjoy uh, an interview. So thank you very much uh, <laughs> uh, for coming on and uh, engaging with us on this. Oh, so, we, well, we look forward to having you back. Um, and, uh, thank you everybody for watching and, uh, until next time, uh, resist poor scholarship, always ask, how do you know that? Thanks guys. <laughs>